Dave de Broncard. Thank you. It is indeed an unlikely journey that would bring me from being a very ordinary guy working in high-tech marketing outside Nashua, New Hampshire, uh, in the, the Boston area, uh, to be here and traveling around the world delivering this message. Uh, at many of the sessions here uh, at this international forum, we've heard about the power of patient stories and even clinician stories. Uh, one of the proposals last night at the, at the, the Million Pound Challenge was for a website that I think should be done uh, where clinicians can tell their side of medical error stories. There's a, a nonprofit in Boston called MITS, Medically Induced Trauma Support Services, uh, which helps both clinicians and patients and families deal with the aftermath. Uh, we know for a fact that information alone doesn't change behavior. Uh, it really helps to have stories. It builds empathy and it builds a case for action. I'm going to be sharing with you one of my stories uh, uh, and to present to you what I've learned about the history of what we call the e-patient movement, how I came to have the nickname e-patient Dave, which I'll be explaining. Uh, and the title of the talk is Visions for the e-patient movement. Uh, and in fact, I'll be talking about some visionaries who have foreseen the e-patient movement. The important thing to understand here is that the world is, is changing. Uh, it always does, of course, but so often we find that adopting the change and taking advantage of what's newly possible is impeded by people who either are clinging to the past or people who just don't realize what has changed and what hasn't. Throughout my career, my job in technology was to explain to people how fancy, new, clever things work and how it makes new things possible. The first visionaries I'll mention are Warner Slack and Charlie Safran, two senior physicians at my hospital, Beth Israel Deacon is in Boston. Dr. Slack has been saying since the 1970s that patients are the most underused resource. Now, originally he was talking about in information systems, but people are increasingly saying this about all of medicine. The challenge, the thing that we need to figure out is given the amount of training it takes to become a brilliant physician, nurse, clinician of any sort, how can it be that someone like me with no medical training whatsoever could possibly have anything useful to say. That's the focus of the essay that I have in the current issue of the British Medical Journal, uh, and it's a deep and important question. Things are possible today that were not possible 20 years ago. Some foundation principles. First of all, patient is not a third person word. The first medical, the first medical uh, conference I talked to uh, I saw that everyone was talking about patients as if it were somebody out there on the street. But if you haven't personally experienced this yet, trust me that your time will come when this is really relevant to you. So please don't think about it as the people in beds that you care for, but think about it as something that will be the subject of discussion at your breakfast table someday. Patients are the ultimate stakeholder, and yet, unlike any other industry, we tend not to ask them what's important. The cultural assumption is that, of course, the scientists and researchers who brought us penicillin and the cancer treatments that saved my life and everything else, of course, they're the ones who know what's valuable. But increasingly, we see things like Michael Graves just presented uh, in his talk, for those of you who are here, about the hospital room that he was in was just absurdly designed uh, because nobody was looking at things from the patient's point of view. And then finally... Uh, in terms of trying to create change, I've, having worked in high tech, I've seen lots of innovations that come along that just don't get anywhere, and you learn to look for what are the leverage points that will actually lead to change. The urge to care for our children and elders. This, this is socially powerful, and it's motivating to clinicians in my experience. Somebody may resist my desire to look at my medical record, but hardly anyone will say that to a parent who's trying to save a sick kid. Okay, so in terms of social change, think about this. The good news is, is I come to relieve your cognitive dissonance. All right, cognitive dissonance happens when we observe something that just clashes with our paradigm. And the answer 
is that things have changed, and I will explain what has changed and what hasn't. At the beginning, I'm going to step back 20 years. The founder of the movement, uh, the, the, to, the, of which I consider myself a member, the e-patient movement, Tom Ferguson, who again is described in my essay uh, in the current issue, opened his manifesto, his 120-page manifesto, with an anecdote from Englewood Hospital in 1994, in which, to make, to make a long story short, a patient was busted for impersonating a doctor because he wanted to see the only published article about some surgery that he was about to have. And the medical library at this hospital would not let him see it because he was not a member of the priesthood. And he called up, called up and said, would you leave it outside the door? Uh, well, unfortunately, the librarian who, uh, who answered the phone knows his doctor and realized this was not uh, the actual doctor on the phone. And as I say, he got busted. He got carried away and detained. Well, that also happened to be the year, 1994, when the web browser was introduced, the Mozilla browser. So next year we're approaching a 20th anniversary and I ask you what can we do to change our thinking to bring it current? How I came to be here, as you heard, I worked in high-tech marketing. I am a data geek. I love Excel. I do unnatural acts with numbers and graphs. What can I say? It's my shame and my joy. Uh, you should see what it's like when I'm shopping for health insurance in the United States. In 2007, I discovered I was almost dead and got better. Some people think that patient empowerment and patient engagement are anti-doctor. Are you kidding? I am alive here because of great medicine. This is about partnership, all right? Nothing I'm going to talk about overthrows the establishment. It's in partnership with the medical establishment. In 2008, I became a blogger. I thought I was dying, it really, in 2007, I thought the video game of my life was going to say, game over, and instead it said, free replay. So I started a blog, what are you going to do? I called it the new life of patient Dave, then when I found out about the e-patient movement the next year, uh, I just renamed myself e-patient Dave, and in 2009, that movement, as you'll hear, formed the Society for Participatory Medicine. Uh, I was involved and I started giving speeches, which I'd done in my day job in marketing. 2010, I felt a calling and I started doing this full time. And in 2011, it went international. Now, some of you may have seen a TED talk that I did a couple of years ago in Holland. I'm going to repeat a couple of slides from there. Back in 1969, Humanity landed on the moon for the first time. This is the first photo ever taken of Earth from another surface in the universe. Amazingly, a few weeks after that, Woodstock happened. And this was a heck of a time for me to be 19 years old. And frankly, here's how I was enjoying myself. That's, that's me at age 19. Well, you know, things are indeed changing. We are getting old now. Okay, I'm 63. I am almost 65. And I was astounded when I, when I learned this next statistic recently. But here is one of the ways the world is vastly different from a short time ago. There is this column in General Surgery News, a doctor named John White, and he recounted how he ran across this statistic. Half of everyone who has ever been 65 is alive today. All right, and I thought, how can that be? But then I thought back, the population today is three times bigger than the end of World War II when the boomers started being born. And a lot more of us are living beyond age 65. And of course, with us being those demanding, self-centered, hedonistic hippies, we have opinions about how we want things done. There will be an enormous amount of spending done to take care of us as we age. And a question that policymakers everywhere need to think about is the things you're working on, are they things that we say are important? There's an in vitro fertilization clinic in Holland that asked their patient community, if you could have anything, what would you want? And the third thing on the list, the first two had to do with more spending, but the third thing on the list was empathy. Empathy from my clinicians. Okay, so think about this. Well, at the same time, 
after, the, uh, after Woodstock, the Whole Earth Catalog was published, which is a hippie self-sufficiency journal, and this young doctor, fresh out of Yale, Tom Ferguson, uh, the one who I referred to as the founder of the movement, uh, became the medical editor, and he wrote about medical self-care and about how we can uh, take care of ourselves. Most of what we do at home is take care of ourselves and our families. But when things get difficult, when disease hits, a major factor limiting our ability to care for our families is access to information. But, and he saw that when the Internet hit 20 years ago, when the web hit, it changed our access to information. And he started predicting things that would happen. Uh, he died in 2006. I never knew him. But these people across the top uh, are people who were doing some of the things he predicted. The man on the left is Jill Friedman, who founded ACOR.org, the network of cancer patient communities that I joined. Next to him is Alan Green of drgreen.com and his wife, the first physician website recognized by the American Medical Association. In the middle is my primary physician, Danny Sands. Does your doctor do email with you? Well, he wrote the first guidelines on how to do doctor-patient email successfully in 1998. Okay, 15 years ago. It takes a while for new practices to disseminate th th throughout medicine. And Ferguson said these e-patients that he noticed were equipped, engaged, empowered, enabled. And this 120-page manifesto that's on the blog, epatients.net, it's a free download, uh, is just story after story of how patients were doing things that you just wouldn't think are possible if all knowledge came from physicians. We need efficiency in medicine as the population changes. Patients are the most underused resource. Now, in 2009, that gang of rowdies uh, formed the Society for Participatory Medicine. Uh, and this is my doctor's actual, this is an actual visit room in our hospital, by the way. Notice how he has the screen turned so that we can both work on it at the same time. He co-authored this system back in the 1990s. To him, the medical record has always been a shared project between the patient and family. And if your practice is one of the ones that will unlock patient access over the web at home, then the exam room comes into the home and medicine becomes part of the continuum of life instead of something that only happens when you go visit the doctor. The people who founded this society said this cannot be run by just a doctor. Uh, it has to be run by a doctor and a patient. And much to my amazement, they elected my doctor and me as the founding co-chairs of this society. So I went from almost dead of cancer in 2007 to chairman of a medical society in 2009, which some people have described as the jujitsu treatment. You use the energy of the attacker to propel yourself forward. Well, I'm going to show you a bit of what an, how an engaged patient interacts. And in, a disengaged person is someone who treats medicine like a car wash. You just roll up the windows and you get things done to you. An engaged patient is somebody who interacts, who thinks, how can I partner with the clinician, okay? I had moved away for a few years, and I was returning to see Dr. Sands for the first time, and so we scheduled a physical. There was nothing particularly urgent. And in preparation for this, I sent him an email with 12 items I wanted to go over. Some people say, you what? You sent your doctor an agenda? My doctor says he's glad I did because he has things that he wanted to go over as well. So he was able to plan out how we were going to spend the time. Now, here's an example of how this works out. I had a strange thing happening in my right eye. It started a couple of months earlier, uh, and I had... I just had this dazzling thing happen, a sparkling pattern, and as it, it started getting bigger, and it was boomerang-shaped, and it got bigger and bigger, and in a half an hour, it had outgrown the eye. The first time it happened, I thought, whoa, flashback from the Woodstock years. The second time it happened, I thought, wait a minute. And the third time, I thought, what is this? And I started taking notes. Now, instead of taking time during the visit, to explain that to him the way I just did to you, and those of you who are physicians, you might be thinking, hmm, diagnosis, diagnosis, what is this? I went out and Googled, I put in some time, and found the best description I could have, and I pasted it into the email. I said, this picture is exactly what it looks like, and the description on this website matches what I had happened. I gave him the URL so he could go check it out, 
People say patients shouldn't diagnose themselves on the internet. Well, this was a website about ophthalmic migraine, so I pasted it in it to the heading with a question mark. I wasn't being the doctor, I was doing everything in my power to communicate with my professional to make our time together more efficient. As it happens, we got this taken care of before I even got to the visit. Now, another thing that had happened was another complaint I had was a stiff shoulder. Not really bad, but instead of wanting to reach up like this, I'd do this. So I said, you know, I'm probably going to need to see an orthopedist. Please get me a referral in advance so I don't have to wait months afterwards. That's one of the things I did that ultimately saved my life because the fact that I didn't have a delay is what made possible what happened next. I had the, the physical with him on December 29th. On January 2nd, I saw the orthopedist. And January 3rd, 2007, 9 a.m., this is one of these moments that's burned into the mind. I don't know what the mechanism by which is by which the mind goes into this total record and playback. But 9 a.m., I remember the color of the partition carpet on my cubicle walls. I remember the color of the desk. I remember what the Sony telephone looked like on the desk. The phone rang, and it was Dr. Sands. He said, Dave, the radiologist called me. Uh, he, I pulled up the image on my screen, and I'm thinking, well, I'd like to pull up the image on my screen. I, you might want to if it were you. He said, Dave, your shoulder's going to be fine. It's just a rotator cuff problem, but there's something in your lung. And that shadow was not supposed to be there. Now, on my website, epatientdave.com, there are lots of longer talks about this whole process for those who want it. Well, long story short, I had an ultrasound uh, and, then other, and then a CAT scan. Uh, and what we found was that it was kidney cancer. This is a different tumor. That's the size of a golf ball. Uh, and in fact, what I had was stage 4, grade 4 renal cell carcinoma which is a heck of a diagnosis to have out of nowhere when you don't feel sick. This will get your attention. Okay? This, this is the diagram of stage 4 kidney cancer uh, from the, the website of the drug that I eventually got, high dosage interleukin-2. Those are my tumors. Three of those are their standard ones, and then I have the extra ones. There's, the first pain I had was in the, the tumor in the femur there. A couple of months after the initial diagnosis, uh, I fainted one morning in the bathroom and landed on that leg. And when my wife woke me up, shaking me, Dave, 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 I looked. Fortunately, I was in shock because my femur was shaped like this. The big metastasis, the thing had just snapped. And I want to repeat how grateful I am to the best in medicine. Because you can't see her here behind this stand, but I'll just stand on this leg. My balance is no better than it ever was, but my leg is repaired. My life works again. Part of my motivation in working on participatory medicine is that I want the clinicians who put in all those years of training and clinical experience and everything to have a better life that's more satisfying for them with less frustration about inefficiencies and all of that. I could go on at ages for ages. Anyway, by the time I scored my disease, what I found was that my median survival was just 24 weeks after diagnosis. Now you think 20, that's five and a half months from now. So what are we, the, the middle of April? So like what, late September, that's it, you're dead. And I remember lying, with, when I realized this, I woke up at 1 a.m. looking at the ceiling of my bedroom. I vividly recall it thinking, what am I doing sleeping? It's like, really, game over. I remember thinking, what's, my dad's funeral had been a year and a half before. Stories, patient stories, listen to the pain, the fear. Okay. I remember what mom's face looked like at dad's funeral. I thought, what's she going to look like when she buries her son? I talked to my daughter who was just out of college and her boyfriend and said, this does not look good, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to approach it methodically. And you guys don't get married prematurely. Don't do anything stupid just so you can do it while dad's still alive. We're going to face this. Well, as soon as the diagnosis was concerned, confirmed, in addition to referring me to, uh, to, to a superb oncologist, my primary referred me to the internet. I like to say my doctor prescribed ACOR. He said, you're an online kind of guy. You might like this patient community. 
consider this before you go into shock over the idea that patients, that there might be some value on the internet. Within the first two hours of my posting a message there, they told me, this is an uncommon disease, get to a specialist hospital. There's no cure, but high dosage interleukin-2 sometimes works, and when it does, about half the time, it's permanent. It usually doesn't work, but sometimes it does. Here I am six years later. The side effects are severe. They can kill you. That's why you have to get to a specialist hospital. Don't let them give you anything else first, because it reduces the chances that interleukin will work. That's not published in any peer-reviewed journal article. But my oncologist agrees it's valid. It's good advice. What's going on here? And here are four doctors in your area who do it and their phone numbers. Now, is this useful? The, and what's interesting is here we are six years later, there is no peer-reviewed journal article, no website approved by the FDA or anything that gives patients this advice. It does not replace what oncologists and nurses do. It supplements it. Okay, the most underused resource, the patient communities, I like to say patients know what patients want to know. When a patient gets a desperate diagnosis, the question I will tell you on their mind right from the beginning is, am I dying now? But you try finding that on any established medical website. Well, long story short, five and a half hour laparoscopic surgery and the interleukin worked for me. There's that same lesion 50 weeks later. I haven't had a drop of anything since July 23rd of 2007, and I am all better. It's, in a way, it's, it's a shame because I'd lost 40 pounds, and my doctor had been telling me to lose weight for ages. And I actually said to, to a nurse in one follow-up visit a year later, I said, could I have a little bit of the cancer back, you know, with a knob to control it? And she, smit, she actually hit me. She hit me gently, but uh, you've know, you got to have a sense of humor. Now, here's a question. I'm an MIT graduate. I'm scientifically trained. I understand the scientific method. I understand peer review. How can it be that the most useful and relevant up-to-the-minute information can possibly exist outside of traditional channels? Really, if we have put our faith in this process, don't trust anything if it's not peer reviewed. Well, of course, uh, those of you who are familiar with Ben Goldacre's work know there's a whole lot of problems with what does get through the peer review process, but this is a separate question. Because of the web, this is what's changed, okay? I spoke a year and a half, two years ago, at the, a meeting of the Israel Internet Society in Jerusalem, a meeting of Israeli doctors and lawyers considering the ethics of using the Internet in medicine when the information out there is not well controlled. Man, if you want to see people debate, okay, Israeli doctors and lawyers. My best friend is, is, is an Israeli physicist. I can say this. Uh, it was amazing. And the last thing between dinner and them was me, the specimen. Uh, and I said, I know it feels like the world where you were trained has ended. The world has changed, but it has not ended. There is too much information now for anyone to know everything. So any clinician whose sense of self-worth depends on knowing everything, is in big trouble. It's no insult if a less trained person has seen some facts that you haven't, but there's still no substitute for the trained mind and the years of clinical experience to put this into context. So what we need to do, in a way, is liberate the trained medical mind from the burden of falsely thinking that they can know everything get them freed up so they can spend their time thinking and welcome patient contributions. Now that's not to say that everything any patient says is gold. There are idiots on the internet. You know, I'm fond of saying that I met my wife on Match.com in 1999, but before I found her I went through some suboptimal results. You know? And yet I didn't marry the first one I found. Right? The newest information from Susanna Fox at the Pew Internet and American Life Project in Washington says that although the, the majority of American adults Google health information regularly, they don't make important decisions on action until they check with their trusted professional. Okay, so this is a resource of people who are... So often I hear, well, patients are lazy slugs. They don't want to do anything. They just sit on their butts. Well, look what happens when a patient Googles and brings something in the way I did. So often the doctor's eyes roll. They get told, stay off the Internet. You can't... It's, 
let's think about it. Dr. Donald Lindbergh, Ferguson interviewed him in his, uh, in his white paper. Uh, and for Lindbergh, he's the director of the National Library of Medicine. They take in all the journal articles. He said that when he was a medical student, he was told a good doctor would read two articles a night to keep up on things. He said, if I did that today, at the end of a year, I'd be 400 years behind. It's not possible anymore to keep up on everything. The lethal lag time, there is a moment in every paper, the development of every paper, every clinical trial and so on, where, where the lead investigator says, we will be able to publish this. From that moment until it goes through, writing, submission, peer review, and everything, and gets to your own doctor's desk to perhaps be read, Ferguson called it the lethal lag time, two to five years. Now, this may be shorter in some cases now. Papers like PLOS One, journals like PLOS One can, can do it faster. But if you have a median survival of 24 weeks, this is a problem. Okay, the idea, in, in technology we call this information latency. You click a link on a website and it starts spinning and the information doesn't come to you. Well, if you're clicking save me and the information is out there and is a year or two from reaching your doctor's office. See, now here's, my, here's the thing, the, the false burden that we put on professionals. A GP in America, I don't know what the number is in the UK, but a GP in America has between 1,500 and 2,000 patients a list of 10 to 11,000 conditions on which they're supposed to be current. And yet, in the kidney cancer patient community, there is one subject where they go deep and wide. Okay? I know of people who have found researchers working on something that was years from being published. Uh, and they, the, an, another example is in, in metastatic breast cancer. A woman named Judy Fetter, through three patient communities, found a researcher in a lab working on something uh, that, that for which there was no commercialized product yet. And the hallmark of participatory medicine is she didn't bring it to her oncologist and hey, say, hey, stupid, why didn't you know this? She said, I found this, what do you think? And with their collegial relationship, they discussed it. He looked, he said, sounds interesting. They tested her. It, it looked reasonable. They were out of all other options. They concocted an N of one thing, and she got another 18 months in her life watching her grandchildren grow up. All through the power of this connected, focused, smart social network. Equally important, her grandchildren got another year and a half of knowing her as they grew up. Now, this lethal lag time, uh, at first I was incensed when I discovered this because I assumed that the whole medical profession, everybody would have instant access, like if they had an IBM Watson just dishing the latest information constantly. Well, just last month I learned about a book called The Fourth Paradigm that puts this in perspective. Uh, dissemination of medical discoveries all right, to clinical practice over the last 2,500 years. It follows this linear curve, which is amazing, starting uh, with things, oh, I don't know, autopsies discovered in the first few hundred years uh, AD, and it, it took over a thousand years for that to be widely distributed. The, th this chapter in the book, The Fourth Paradigm, specifically talks about scurvy. Did you know it took 264 years after the discovery that citrus cures scurvy for it to disseminate throughout the British Empire, not just the Navy, but the entire merchant trade as well, all I can say is, avast ye scurvy knaves. And in the last 150 years, Lister and antisepsis uh, in the, uh, in the 1800s, if you look at the, the chart there, notice the curve is still continuing. It took about 30 or 40 years for that to disseminate. Uh, the H. pylori bacteria took about 17 years after it was proven. There may be information that has been developed that every clinician has not been told about yet or may just simply may not know about. And then finally, Ferguson pointed out there's this concern that if people do something stupid, they'll have death by Googling. Uh, and a, a man named Eisenbach in Germany about 10 years ago studied for three years trying to collect true stories of people who died because of stupid Google advice, uh, and he found not a single case. In German we say null, 
Not a single case. And yet, we know the number of deaths by medical errors. In the US, we have this report. This was 1999 to Errors Human. And Ferguson brilliantly observed, said these conclusions are no more anti-doctor or anti-medicine than Galileo was anti-astronomer. And Dr. Sands, in turn, and he also said, arguably, it's more dangerous not to Google your condition. So Dr. Sands says, well, so how can patients participate if they can't see what I see in the medical record? Do you, if you are a clinician, do you invite your patients to see what's in the medical record? In, the America, uh, in America, we have something called the blue button. It's an ability to download your data, the patient to download their data. At first, as always happens, people said, well, what's the patient going to do with a, a stupid printout of just numbers and, and things? But that's how you seed a new ecosystem. My part of the industry that I worked in was in graphic arts, specifically typesetting. Some of you may remember typesetting machines. And when desktop publishing came along, we said, this is a toy. Well, within five years, the toy had become so powerful because the market vastly expanded because it turned out that when these great untrained consumers had access to information, other people developed software tools, and it all became more useful. The market was huger uh, and exploded, and typesetting machines don't exist anymore. Then there's the question of data quality. One of my radiology reports described me as a 53-year-old woman. I am not, okay? And I was astounded. And it's funny because I lived in the mythology that said, of course they're careful about all this data that's in the system. These people are the gods called doctors. Well, what I didn't appreciate was that they may be the gods called doctors, but the workflows in the data systems with which they work are nowhere near as well controlled as what I had to deal with in my day job. If I imported data and I got a phone number into a record where the, where the postal code is supposed to be, that was a problem for us, you know, and we had to constantly check for accuracy, and yet nobody pays to have the accuracy of medical records checked. So, what are we going to do? Pound on the physicians? Well, I say, who has most at stake with the accuracy, completeness, and availability of the medical records? Did you know that most, a majority of medical records contain a mistake. And sometimes, you know, the, this is not just a patient's rights issue. No clinician can possibly perform to the top of their ability if they're given wrong information. Okay? When my mother had a hip replacement a year and a half ago, she was transferred from the hospital to rehab. They don't have electronic records transfer, so they had to print the stuff out and retype it back into the new system. Uh, her hyperthyroid was transcribed as hypothyroid. Could have been a disaster. The painful thing is that the physicians involved could have been involved in a, a, a serious error when all they were doing was reading the information they were given. Imagine a licensing exam where you're marked wrong on a question because of information they didn't tell you. And yet that's the clinical reality. As it happens, my two what I call alpha sisters were on top of the situation with mom. And they spotted the mistake and got it corrected. Patient and family engagement with the medical record prevented a disaster and benefited everyone, including the clinicians. My takeaway from this is that people perform better when they're informed better. No surprise there. But there's also a corollary which I offer for everyone who says patients should be kept apart from this information. The corollary is it's perverse to keep people in the dark and then call them ignorant. Hmm? And yet I, I see it all the time. Many of you have heard of Dr. Eric Topol. Daniel Kraft in the previous session mentioned him, session mentioned him a world-class cardiologist. Uh, it's funny because a couple hundred years ago when the stethoscope was new, people were saying, ah, this is never going to go anywhere. Well, Topol points out that the cardiologist may act, or that, that the stethoscope may be on its way out because it exists so that you can, without cutting a person open, listen to sounds and figure out what's going on in their heart. Well, with this V-scan pocket ultrasound, 
uh, ultrasound now, he can actually look at the thing, look at the heart there. Some medical schools are giving the students now, in addition to the first stethoscope in their pocket, giving them a V-scan ultrasound. Think about the future. I said things have changed. It's going to be really uncomfortable if you expect the world to be the way it was 10 and 20 years ago. Kraft also talked about this um, this alive core thing. This is an iPhone case and those two silver strips you put your fingers on uh, and it gives you an EKG. And I wouldn't think that this would be accurate enough for clinical use, but in fact, it's been approved for sale over here and it was even approved by the FDA, although of course our protective paternal bless them FDA says consumers can't buy it without a prescription from a doctor. Of course, we wouldn't want them to, to, don't get me started. Anyway, on his way home last month from a conference in New Orleans, Topol was on a plane. They came over the loudspeaker and said, is there a doctor in the house? There was a woman having palpitations and he got out his alive core, put her fingers on it and established that she was having atrial fibrillation. She has a history of AFib, so they didn't need to put the plane down. And the world I want you to think about is a few years from now where she has her history with her so he can not only see what's happening at the moment, but he can put it in context. All right? And that's, this is the world that's happening. Now, here's an objection that I hear all the time. Well, my patients aren't like that. You know, Dave, that's fine for you, but... Uh, they aren't asking for this. Well, folks, this is culture change. So what you want to do, culture is our set of shared assumptions that we say to each other about who's capable of what and what's possible. Think to other cultural revolutions. On November, uh, in November, on the U.S. Election Day, somebody on Facebook posted this flyer from 100 years ago, association opposed to women getting the vote. And you just have to love the logic here, okay? 90% of women either don't want it or don't care. There you go. That's a good reason to not give them the vote. And yet that's exactly the logic by which we say, well, my patients aren't asking for this. Sorry. And I get so excited about this. I'm sorry. The, uh, and just to show, remember I said cognitive dissonance? Look at this. Look at this next bullet point. 80% of women eligible are married, so they could only double or cancel their husband's vote. What? What are you thinking about? But you know, when people try to rationalize, so think about this the next time somebody says, well, patients aren't interested in that. You know what? If people haven't been told or invited, told they're allowed to do something or invited to do it, you can't attach any meaning, meaning to the fact that they're not asking for it, okay? Now, it's my work to go out there and tell both clinicians and patient communities, look, new things are possible, no kidding. Looking at the medical record, I talked to a doctor I, um, in the UK, a GP, I believe his name is Amir Hanan, I apologize if I got it wrong, last night, seven years ago, he flicked the switch on the EMR in his practice, and roughly 20% of his patients now are looking at the actual unedited visit notes, all right? And it's interesting because hardly people have responded to this offer, but very few people have been asking for it, but recently, Recently, he started to have people come to his practice because word has gotten around that they offer it. Well, there's this big concern in the U.S. that if you let patients see the visit notes, the doctor's office will be overrun with phone calls about, why did you call me an SOB? Well, no, sir, that stands for shortness of breath and things like that. Well, you know, I mean, it's a valid concern. So that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation ran a three-year-long study uh, where they tested what happens when patients get to see the actual visit notes. And the results came out last October. Number one, contrary to everyone's expectations in the profession, patients did use the notes. The first finding that was published was the baseline attitude survey at the beginning, where 30 to 35 percent of physicians thought patients would be interested, and over 90 percent of patients said they were interested. They reported important benefits, including doing better with their medications, isn't that amazing? The number they got here, people reporting doing better with their medications, would have qualified for a Nobel Prize if it were something clinical. They did not feel overwhelmed. 
few doctors reported significant impacts on their workflow. A substantial number did report changing their documentation, especially on mental health and substance abuse. Many described strengthened relationships with their patients just from letting the patient see what's in the visit notes, including better shared decision-making, better communication. Importantly, at the end of the study, they said, okay, we're done, everybody can just switch it off, okay? Everyone wanted to continue. 99% of patients wanted to continue. Tom Del Banco, the principal investigator on this, said in all his years, he has never seen a 99% finding on anything. Think about this because this is your future. 17 to 26% of doctors said they preferred not to, but when they saw the rest of the results, on the day when they could switch it off, not a single one did. Every single doctor who participated, including the skeptics, has said, that's it, I'm in, because their patients loved it and used it. And importantly, 85% of patients said availability of open notes would influence their choice of providers and health plans. Now, I'm going to skip ahead in the interest of time because I want to... There are just so many things. Now it's all on my website. Well, you know it's a revolution when the artists and musicians start to show up. Regina Holiday is a painter who has, is painting people's medical stories on jackets. Uh, uh, at the TED conference a couple of years ago, uh, I performed a bit of the e-patient rap. Uh, I said, I want to be an e-patient just like Dave. Well, that's, and what's amazing about it is that it's, it's in the top half of the most viewed TED Talks of all time. Not because of the rap, but it ends with a chant, let patients help, let patients help. And the, it's been translated into 26 languages. Uh, and in fact, three doctors and one of their sons wrote a music video. I won't fall the doctor, a two fall the nurse. You see, and you're trying to treat me so to make me feel worse. Give me my damn data. It goes on for three minutes. And amazingly, see one of the artists and musicians, Ross Martin, the second from the right, a month after he produced and published this video, they found out his wife has breast cancer. Well, she had lymphoma as a teenager many years earlier, and in those days, lymphoma was treated with massive doses of radiation. The current doctors wanted to know how much she got and how she was protected so they could plan the current treatment. The information is gone. It was held onto for the required seven years. Who has more at stake in the availability and accuracy of the information? Well. For me, this was me on the night that I, of that physical, I was dying and didn't know it. Ten months later at the office Halloween party, somebody snapped this picture of me grinning with the ghoul. Ten, and uh, a year and a half later, I did get to laugh with my mother on the day when I did walk my daughter down the aisle. And I will tell you, thank you to medicine. It is great to be alive. And this Christmas, she gave me a jigsaw puzzle. This was the first part I could put together. Hi, can't wait to meet you, because the rest was a mess of black and gray. It's an ultrasound, and I'm going to be a granddaddy. And new software tools? Consider this. Have, do you know about... Well, yeah, I agree. That, do you know about 4D ultrasound? I didn't even know about this. She said, Dad, this is what I want for a birthday present. Higher and higher resolution, they put them together. You can watch the baby's face in utero. Unbelievable. She has her mother's nose. Well, we want you to listen. Listen, listen, listen. The things that you're spending on, are they things that patients have asked for? My daughter and her husband and the baby want you to listen. Please, medicine, let patients help. Let patients help. Let patients help. Let patients help. Thank you and Godspeed. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I hugged an editor. <laughs> Let patients help. So, I think we'll finish there. Thank you very oh, much indeed, you patient Dave. Sorry. That's wonderful. Oh, no, a fantastic thanks. talk.